now, all right, that revival is bringing back to life. That was better. I even got the bass part of your voices on that. All right. So it's bringing back to life. That is exactly what revival is. Simply put, revival is a restoration of life. Now notice this, it's a restoration of not just simple living, but it's a restoration of Zoe or of God life. It's God's breath one more time being breathed into the creation. That's what revival is really about. Revival is God doing it again. Hallelujah. That's what revival is. God doing it again. It is generated by a hunger so great until there is nothing nor anyone that we will allow to cause us to become distracted. I want to read that again because the Holy Spirit impounded that in me this week and just stirred that thought in me. When you're really hungry for the move of God, when you're really hungry for the manifestation, when you're really hungry for God to to do something in your life or the lives of your family, then you will not allow anything nor anyone uh, to cause you to become distracted. I found out something. You get a man hungry, you're not going to keep him away from the table. Amen. I mean, most men, when they're hungry, if they come in uh, and they smell the food cooking, where do they go? To the kitchen. What do they do? When their back is turned, they grab some. All right. And then they act like they didn't, but they did. Uh, Why? Because they're Hungry. That doesn't go over too good with my wife. It's almost like she's got eyes in the back of her head. Okay, don't touch that. Okay, but I'm hungry. Hunger will cause you not to allow anything to distract you. I believe uh, that if you're hungry for a move of God, you're not going to let anything distract you. I believe that if you want your children saved, uh, you're not going to let anything distract you. I believe that if you want to go in the rapture, you're not going to let anything distract you. If you're hungry for what God has said uh, is going to happen, uh, you will not be distracted uh, by what's going on around you. Amen? If distraction was a weapon uh, that men that are hungry were given to, we would not have had an upper room. We would not have had the first great awakening in America. We would not have had the second great awakening in America. And we're headed for the third one right now. We're on the verge of the third great awakening uh, to where God is going to pour out of his spirit in great measure and multitudes are going to find Jesus Christ. I believe that. But if we are distracted, uh, then we'll sit home when we should be in a prayer meeting. When we're distracted, uh, anything anyone says uh, will create the sensitivity of our nature to rise up in us and say, how dare you preach that and try to convict me? You see, that's distraction. Hunger, true hunger, will cause us to pursue what some say are unpursuable. True hunger will cause us to reach out even when our flesh says you don't feel like doing it. So if you're hungry, nothing is going to stop it. A prophetic word God spoke into me is this. uh, There are many today that are tired of the uninspired, lifeless services uh, that are being replicated across the country that we call having church. There's being birthed uh, in many a desire for something uh, that gives substance to their time uh, that they're giving on Sunday morning uh, to God. Uh, Something uh, that will help them grow their 
faith in God, grow their faith in themselves, grow their faith in others, and have a faith that they will be able to overcome the obstacles that inevitably come their way every day. God, give us that kind of faith because it's that kind of faith that's going to bring the victory. Give the Lord a hand clout right there. In many cases, the church is not producing this. We've ended up with what I call misdirected pursuits. Our pursuits have become self-driven and not God-driven. These self-focused pursuits are depleting, uh, diluting, uh, and destroying the church instead of growing it. Now understand something. When I say the church, I'm talking about every child of God in the world today. Every child of God. I know this sounds a little negative right now, but hold on. It's going to turn a corner in just a moment. This is a word that God spoke into my spirit. I have people coming up to me in camp meetings, in Bible conferences. As the Holy Ghost begins to stir, they'll come up and say, Preacher, I've not heard preaching like that uh, in many years. I've not seen God move like this in many years. And where do I preach? Mostly charismatic, Pentecostal hostile of full gospel camp meetings. What am I saying? Folks, uh, the move of God uh, is not being embraced uh, by a great majority of us that know we need it. Uh, but I've got news for you. The millennium generation, who is the generation uh, that is moving into adulthood right now, are making this known. Uh, they're tired of dead, lifeless uh, sermons that do nothing that alter their life. Uh, they are ready for truth. Uh, and you know what? What they're doing, uh, they're coming out of the established church uh, and they're looking for a church uh, where Jesus Christ uh, is once again Lord of their lives. Uh, give the Lord a hand clap because that's who we are hungry to become. It's being noted all across the nation today in people that deal with church. History bears out there are people who have made a mark on their generation because of great moves of God. I don't want to just go through life. I want to affect life around me. Amen? I don't want to just come to church and dance and shout and jerk and jiggle and then go out and live my life the way I choose to live it the next day. History bows out. There are people who have made a mark on their generation. Why? Because of great moves of God. But through time, they become so caught up in their own organization, they cease to function as an organism uh, that brings life uh, or that God can work through to bring life uh, and light to a spiritually darkened world. Uh, God, one more time, just one more time, I want to see a move that shakes hell. Uh, just one more time, uh, I want to see men and women that are stand up uh, and shout greater as the God that is in control control of me than the God that is in control of the world. Are you hearing me today? This are, are men and women that have touched the generations down through time. And I pray today that we in Messenger Church will be stirred as we've never been stirred. And we will be willing to do whatever it takes to see the Shekinah glory of God fill up the tabernacle one more time. You see, I want you to understand what God is saying today. I want you to understand that when I say revival, I'm not talking about a preacher. I'm not talking about the latest fad sweeping through the church. I'm talking about an unadulterated move of God that causes the sinner on the pew to want to get up out of that pew, come into this altar, and make Jesus Lord of their life. I'm talking about a revival that has stirred the mom and dad up out of bed on a Sunday morning and make them want to show the example of 
what it is being a child of God. I'm talking about a revival that'll put depression out the door, oppression out the door, addiction out the door, deafness out the door, blindness out the door, because Jesus is still Lord and he is my Lord today. <laughs> that is a longing, but hear this. God said, okay, let's give them some word for that promise. Let's let them know, let the nations know what I've said I'm going to do. Look at somebody and say, he's doing it. Now, I'm going to take a little bit of extra time on some scriptures, but I want you to get them in your spirit. I started to even print them off for you because I don't want you to forget what God said. Isaiah 43, 5 and 7. I want you to hear that God has promised us more than we are experiencing. Can I say that again? God has promised us more than we're experiencing. I want the more. I want the more. I want the more. Ula Basaya. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want more of what God has. I want more peace. I want more joy. I want more power. I want more grace. I want more mercy. I want to love more. I want to heal more. I want to deliver more. I want to embrace the wounded, the broken more. Amen. Hallelujah. We'll get deeper into that as the Holy Spirit opens this up over the next two or three weeks. But notice this, Isaiah 43, 5 and 7. Do not fear, for I am with you. How many of you praise God that he's with you? Isaiah 43, 5 through 7. Amen. If we can get it on the screen, it really help out here. Amen. Notice this. Do not fear, for I am with you. Now here's part of what I want you to see. I will bring your descendants from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up. And to the south, do not keep them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Even everyone who is called by my name. For I have created him for my glory. I have formed him and I have made him. Do you know what God just said? God just said there's coming a time that your children who are in the east are going to come back to the family of God. There's coming a day your children that are into the west are going to come back to the family of God. And then God said not only is that going to happen, but he changed course here. He said they're going to come from the east. Uh, he said they're going to come from the west. But then notice what he did next. He didn't just prophetically say what's going to happen. Uh, he said this. Uh, he said, I will say to the north. Uh, in other words, uh, it's not a promise, but now it becomes a command. Uh, God will say to the north, uh, give up the harvest. Uh, in other words, uh, he's going to say to the north, uh, give up the ones that are being held back. Uh, he said to the south, uh, don't keep them back. Uh, bring my sons from afar. Hear what I'm telling you. If a devil that's got your son to the east, uh, if a devil that's got your daughter to the west, uh, to the north and to the south, uh, God's about to say, give them up. Uh, you can't hold them any longer. You can't keep them any longer. And brother, when God says it, uh, hell has to bounce up uh, what God demands. Uh, and this is a demand. Uh, give the Lord a hand clap right now. I find myself praying these scriptures. I find myself sometimes looking to the east and saying, East, I command you to give up the harvest. What's east of this building? Gravoy Bluffs. What's east of this building? Arnold, Missouri. What's east of this? 
Illinois. Every devil in Arnold, give up the harvest. Every devil in, the, in Illinois, give up the harvest. Uh, every spirit out of hell, give up the harvest. Listen to me, North County, give up the harvest. Uh, listen, South uh, Jefferson County, give up the harvest. Uh, devil, you, Makoho, devil, you can't have uh, what God has said is mine. Uh, and he told me he would give me my sons, uh, my daughters, my my parents, uh, my husband, give the Lord a hand clap. Give it up. Isaiah 43, 18 through 21. Do not remember. Uh, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Look at someone and say, get over yesterday. I wonder how many people are sitting here right now being eaten up by what someone did to you yesterday or what someone did to you six months ago or what someone did to you a year ago. You're continually dwelling on the past. Maybe you were wrapped deep in sin a year ago. Maybe your past was filled with the very powers of the enemy a year ago. All right, and hell was, was controlling everything that was going on in your life. And, and, and you're, you're trying to worship and you're trying to praise. But yesterday <laughs> comes back into your mind. Yesterday keeps cropping up what someone said, what someone did, some pain you went through. But notice what God said. And you're, you're going to want to listen because of what comes next. God said, don't remember the former things. Let them go. Get over them. Forget them. Hear me now. This is very important. I said this in another sermon. God spoke it into my heart to a lady who had carried an offense for 17 years. And God spoke it with me looking her right in the eye. And I said, I want you to know that the devil is using your past to control your present. Where he can destroy your future. If you don't connect with your offenses of yesterday. If you don't connect with your pain of yesterday yesterday. If you don't disconnect uh, with your sins of yesterday, he will destroy your future because you're bogged down in your present. Uh, but notice this. Uh, all, uh, all things are past. Uh, all things are new. I'm living a new life. Uh, I'm walking a new walk. Uh, he said, forget about yesterday. That's what you call brain erasure. Amen. Erasing, getting rid. Don't remember it. Look at somebody and say, choose not to remember. <laughs> now, this is what blesses me. God can remember everything. God knows everything you did from the day you were born. Every little act, every little thought. God can remember it. He wrote it down. Everything has been written down before you got saved. Even after you got saved, when you look where you shouldn't have been looking. Huh? Uh -uh. You said what you shouldn't have been saying. You entertained what you shouldn't have entertained. Huh? God, God remembers it. He, 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 he has that ability. But let me tell you what grace and mercy does. Grace and mercy is a God that can choose and not to. <laughs> God made a choice. He made a choice to not remember what happened before the blood. He made a choice to not remember what I said, what I did, how I acted before the blood. Brother, when I apply the blood, God erases what I've done in my past and he doesn't remember it anymore because he doesn't want to hold it against me. Get this old song, what 
can wash away my sins. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. God sees your sin. God saw my mistake. God saw my problem. I said, God, I'm so sorry. So God said, I hear you, boy. He picked it up and he threw it as far as the east is from the west and said, I'll never remember it again. And then he comes along through Isaiah and said, says throw that stuff away and don't let what you were control you today get over your yesterday give the heart a hand clap because we are I, I, I like this I, 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 I like this next verse put it up there Jim let, let him see it alright behold everybody say behold anytime you see the word behold something, something something's going to come Amen. That's like, behold. Amen. If anybody ever walks up to that door there and goes, behold. Get ready. Somebody special is going to walk in. Amen. Behold is an important word. It's a word making a proclamation. God's about to say something you need to pay attention to. Now remember what he just did. He said, get over. Don't remember. Then he says, behold, I am going to do what? Say what? Oh, yeah. God is about to do something brand new in you. Huh? You know what I like about new things? No one else ever got it. Huh? It's made just for me. It, it, it's just for my time. It's just for our time. God said, don't you remember yesterday? Behold, proclamation. I'm going to do <laughs> a new thing. A new thing means it's not been done before. A new thing means it's not happened to you before. Now, 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 I know, I know I need to add a little bit of clarity to this for the Holy Spirit taught me something about this some times ago. He said, son, he said, you need to understand something. He said, some of what you experienced was new when you got it. It's not new now, but there are people that have never experienced it before, and so they're going to start experiencing that. It'll be new for them. Uh, are you getting this? Uh, you see, some people have never felt so much of God's power until they felt like that the resurrection was imminent and about to take place. Some people have never had the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Somebody and some people have never spoken in tongues. And so when there comes a wind blowing through this place and people that don't have the baptism start talking in tongues, that's a new thing for them. I may have experienced it. You may have experienced it, but God about to do something uh, that the church has never seen uh, and people have never seen uh, because they have need of it right now. Right now. Right now. Right now God's about to do a new thing. <laughs> Some people don't want a new thing. They're satisfied with the old thing. You need to take on a woman's spirit. She'll wear a dress three times and it's old. And then she don't have nothing to wear. She got to go buy a new thing. Because the old thing has already been worn. I even had one woman one time to come into a service in a church we passed it in the south. And she come in with this new dress on. And she looked down toward the front, and there was another lady that had a dress on just like hers. Identical. She didn't even sit down. She done a new turn, went right back out the door, and went home and changed clothes. All right. Her new thing became an old thing because someone had one just like it. And she was not going to sit in church with no woman having the dress on she had. All right? Because to her, it was an old thing. Uh, are y'all getting what? Ah, oh, you see, we need to understand something. We need to get this. We need to get, get to the point to where, hey, God, I thank you for what I've got now. But I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry for some new stuff. I'm ready for a greater anointing. I'm ready. Oh, oh, Shammai. This was kind of what Elisha felt like when Elisha cried out and said, 
servant Elijah, I want what you want. I want what you got. Elijah said, what do you want? Uh, Elisha said, I don't want just one portion of what you got. I want a double portion of what you got. I praise God for what you've done, Elijah. I praise God for what God did for you, uh, but I want to have double. You know what he was saying? Uh, He was saying, I want what you've got, but I want something new. I want a double. Get this now. Elisha, by the time he ended up in his ministry, he had done double miracles, uh, double prophesying, double moves of God uh, than what Elijah had. Why? Because God did a new thing. Uh, And brother, I'm Musa. I'm ready for God to do a new thing. Uh, I'm ready for a double portion uh, of the Holy Ghost uh, of the living God. Give the Lord a hand clap right now. I'll do a new thing and it shall spring forth. Huh? Amen. What does that mean? That's not springing. I'm on him. Can you handle this? <laughs> Hallelujah. I only weigh 150. Hallelujah. All right. God said, I'm going to spring forth. Okay. You're going to catch me? What you move for after? He going to miss? You can catch 150. What about the other part? Uh, I don't trust you. Hallelujah. Springing is. Huh? Huh? You see, God said, I'm not going to sneak up on you. You're not even going to see it coming. God said, what I'm about about to do is just going to spring out. It's going to come on you before you know it. It's going to hit you before you know it. Mike, I'm ready for God to hit me before I know it. I'm ready for God to feel me before I know it. I'm ready for God to do it. Do the new thing. Do the, hey, look at somebody and say, I am too. Yes, sir. Say, look at somebody and say, it's coming. It's coming. <laughs> Can you handle it? <laughs> that man crazy. I done set up on the front pew of a crazy house. <laughs> no, we're not. Okay, get this now. It'll spring forth. Shall you not know it? You know what that means? You know what it means? I'm going to tell you what it means. All right, shall you not know Some people are not even going to know what God's doing. God would have never put that there if he knew that everybody was going to get the new thing. There are people that don't even get what God's doing. They honestly don't. They don't get it. They don't get it. We're so wrapped up in our carnality until we've lost focus of spirituality. Sometimes I get into this, little, this warfare going on in my mind. As most of you know, and if you don't know, you'll know now, I, I, I do quite a bit of reading, okay? There's hardly a day goes by, well, there's not a day that I'm not in the book, but the Word. But then I read what other men are writing. It's, it's just a part of who I am. So I read a lot of stuff, hear a lot of stuff. But, but, but I, I, get, I go through this battle, you know, where, okay, should I be dealing more with the carnal than the spiritual? Because after all, people need to know, you know, how to do this and how to do that and, and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, I don't preach a lot on clothes. I don't preach a lot on dress. I believe in modesty. I think, I think a woman ought to dress modest and look like a lady. Maybe I should preach on it. Hallelujah. All right. I, but, 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 but. But you know what? I think if you love Jesus the way you ought to love Jesus, nobody's have to, going to have to go around with a bull whip beating up on you to keep you looking the way you ought to look. 
Amen. I, that's the way I, I believe it. I don't think I got to beat you over the head all the time to try to get you to dress a certain way. All right. I mean, I, I grew up in some of that. All right. I really didn't grow up in it. My pastor was so wise. He didn't touch on that. I, my pastor, when I'm growing up as a 13, from 13 to 15 and 16, well, you know what? He preached Jesus, the baptism of the Holy Ghost, the miracle working power of God, and just loving God. That's what he preached into me. My first Pentecostal pastor, that's what he preached in me. I didn't really get into this other stuff until I. I went on the road as a full-time minister, ended up in churches to where that's all they would dwell on, is trying to keep people righteous and trying to keep people holiness by making legislated laws uh, that would straighten up their crookedness. Uh, and you know what I found out? Those were some of the most bound people I ever ran across in all my life. I mean, they worried constantly where their hair was long enough, the dress was black enough, their makeup, oh dear God, put on some makeup, they're going to hell. All right. If you put on them hang-me-downs, uh, you are shook right into hell before you know it. <laughs> Devil will grab you by that hang-me-down and jerk you right in. All right? Yeah, I mean, I, I, that's what I was around. I, I was around that. Amen. Amen. I mean, for the first little while, I didn't wear, when I first went on the road, I got around some of that. I told this on the Wednesday night. I wore black pants, black socks, black shoes. Uh, I tell you, my shirts never came, uh, all right, anywhere above my wrist. Uh, you never saw my elbow. I got news for you. Cut the tape off right here. If my elbow makes you lush, you got a problem, child. Hallelujah. I mean, you are sick in your noggin if my elbow turns you on. Amen. No kids in the house. All right. But I tell you, I wore black. White, black tie, all right? I wanted to be holy, and that's the way they legislated it. But I found out something one day. I found out God loved me when I had a red tie on. <laughs> Hallelujah. I found out God didn't care if I wore blue. Uh, I could even wear pink, just like Preston did. Hallelujah. Because real men wear pink. Oh, amen. Hallelujah. And it didn't bother God. I found out something. If I got my heart right, and if I lived according to the word of God and kept my heart in love with Jesus, I was going to look the way I need to look. I was going to talk the way I need to talk. And I was going to go where I need to go. I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you something. Look at somebody and say, he's going to tell us something. Amen. I'm not going to be a police I'm not going to go around trying to keep you walking in the law. I'm going to preach God's mercy, God's grace, God's goodness. And you fall in, in love with Jesus like you ought to, you're not going to do anything that offend him. Amen. Is that all right? Praise God. Amen. So doing a new thing. And he said, it's going to spring forth. And he said, listen, will you not know it? Some people, Jeff, are not even going to know when God moves. They're so busy wrapped up in carnality, they wouldn't recognize a move of God if it slapped them upside the head. Amen. You know what God is saying? God is saying, I'm about to do it suddenly. I'm about to do something so quick and so sudden. Now, these, these folks, this is what I'm talking about revival here. I'm not talking about a preacher. I'm not talking about an denomination. And you better get this. God's going to do revival on the city street corner. God's going to do revival in Walmart. God's going to do a revival in your job because you have been witnessing just by the way you've been living for years. And people have saw and they've witnessed your life. And there's coming very quickly. I believe people are going to walk up to you and say, I can tell there's a difference in you. But you tell me what that difference is? You're not like everyone else around here. Now let me give you a little bit of advice here and take it as pastoral. You need to. When they start asking you that question, don't start talking about talking in tongues. Uh, don't start rattling off about running and jumping and shaking and all this kind of stuff. Uh, they don't have a clue. But what you do is you start talking about Jesus uh, and you start telling them uh, that the creator of the universe uh, loved us so much 
He gave the only boy he had and he left heaven, came and walked on this earth and men didn't agree with what he had to say so they hung him on a cross and they killed him and put him inside of a tomb. But I just want to tell you, God loved us so much. He took him out of that tomb and now he sits at the right hand of heaven. In other words, folks, just talk about Jesus. Testify about Jesus. Tell about Jesus. And once you do that, Jesus will peel off the depression. He'll peel off the sorrow. He'll peel off the heartache of that person. And you'll give them something they can grab a hold of that nobody can take away from them. Would you give the Lord a hand clap? It's all about Jesus. Okay, okay, okay. Now, now, I, 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 I got to go on. I, I got to go on. But I'm going to make a way in the wilderness. I'm going to put rivers in deserts. In, in, in the wilderness, a wild place. That, that's the place of trouble. That's the place of hardship. That's the place of seemingly impossibilities. You, you have a hard time getting through a wilderness. And I don't know if you've ever gone through a wilderness experience or not, but if you have, you feel like you're all alone in the wilderness. You don't feel like there's any help. But God said, listen, listen, I'm going to be there in your wilderness. And then he said, I'm going to put rivers in the desert. Do you understand the supernatural impact of that? It can't be a desert with a river in it. The only way it's a desert is because there's no water there. God said, I'm going to take what is impossible and I'm going to make it possible. I'm going to put a river in a desolate place. Now, do you understand? Do you, do, you, <laughs> you, do, do, do you get what John said? When John said, out of your innermost being shall flow what? A river of living water. So what has God said? God said, I'm going to put a river in your desert. Now, that, you know what that is? That, that's El Shaddai showing up. El Shaddai is he that steps out of law or out of the created laws established through creation. All right. And El Shaddai is the one that said to the Red Sea, stand up. El Shaddai is the one that parted Jordan. El Shaddai is the one that said to a dead man been dead three days, come up out of that tomb. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's El Shaddai. So here now, El Shaddai says, in the middle of your dry places, in the middle of your desolate places, in the middle of your places of wantness and dryness, I'm going to put a river there. It may not be normal. I'm going to do it anyhow. It may not be natural. I'm going. Are y'all getting what I'm saying, folks? Revival is God life coming back into you, and you one more time are going to start experiencing God at a level you've never experienced Him before. And and get this, get this. I know we have to minister and we have to preach on things that is good for us physically, good for us mentally. Preach stuff that deals with our marriages and the rearing of children. I believe in all of that. But folks, I believe that the foundational truth to all of this is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, if we get that relationship intact, uh, then he's going to give us the wisdom and the teaching and the revelation to be able to understand everything that's coming into our life. And he's just about there are people here right now that you're dry. You don't have revival in your life. You don't have revival in your family. You don't have revival in your household. Uh, you're going through a rut day in, day out. Uh, there's no excitement. The smiles are hardly ever there. But God is about to put a river in the middle of your desert uh, and you're about to experience Jesus like you've never experienced him before. Give the Lord a hand clap. There, there. I'm giving you one more. No, I, I'm, well, I'm going to give you just part of one more. Joel 2, 21. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice. I've taught on the scripture. I was, I'm, there's a lot of it I'm going to, to get into. But today I'm going to stop on this, this, this one verse. Okay? This one verse. 21st verse. And there's a lot of them I want to share because God had so impacted me with it. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do. Everybody say, will do. Say it again. Will do what? Say what? Great things. Great things. What? If, 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 if I pointed a finger at you and said to you, what would be a great thing in your life? And just think of this for just a moment. 
If I ask you to give me something that would be a great thing that you need, that you're going through, what would it be? What, 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 what would be a desire of your heart? Just think of it. Just think of it. Just very quickly. Just think of it. Okay? It's a great thing. You see, what's great for some is not great for others. You see, there's some things you need I don't need. And so it's not even relevant to me other than my heart for you. Okay? But great things is not defined by any one certain thing, but it's defined by your need. Because God said, I will supply all of your needs. So when your need is supplied, that's a great thing for you. You may need a house payment. Okay? Maybe you're behind on your house. And you need a house payment. And if God supernaturally made a way for you to pay that payment, wouldn't that be a great thing? Huh? Maybe you're not making enough to, to even buy groceries for your children. So it would be a great thing if you went into work tomorrow and your boss came up and said, we're giving you a $3 an hour raise. That would be a great thing. Are you seeing what I'm saying? Maybe you need a set of tires. Maybe there's some condition in your body. Maybe you have sugar diabetes. Maybe you have a heart condition. Maybe there's problems all right, going on with, with, with uh, your hearing. All right? This started with me about four months ago where I started losing the bass sound. And I, I, I've not lost volume. I've lost bass sound. So what it's done is it has destroyed the beauty of music for me because I'm not hearing the bass in it. Now, I'm telling you where I am this I've admitted I've got the problem but I've told the devil the problem don't have a right to have me all right it doesn't have a right to have me so I rebuke the problem in the name of Jesus Christ and there'll be a way it'll be taken care of before it's all over with so I'm not living into bondage to that so that would be a great thing for my bass sounds to be to uh, be reestablished back into my hearing somebody said oh you're just getting old you say that again you'll find out how ungodly I can be hallelujah all right no I just kidding I'm kidding. Amen. No, no. So, see, a great thing is determined by your need. Amen. Amen. I mean, God's not going to give you something you don't need just so you can brag on what He gave you. All right? Somebody said, I wonder why they're a millionaire and I'm not. They can handle it and you can't. Glory, glory. God's not going to give a child of God something He can't handle that'll make Him worse off than He was before He had it. So we need to get this, all right? God said, I'm going to do a great thing. But I want you to notice something that most of us glide over. We slide over. We, 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 we do it after the great thing comes. But notice what God said. Notice, notice, notice. God said, well, number one, don't live in fear. You see, fear is counterproductive to faith. You can't live in faith and fear at the same time. You're, you're, you're controlled by one or the other. If you're living in fear, don't try to convince me you're living in faith. It just doesn't work that way, all right? You're either walking in faith or walking in fear. It's one or the other. And fear counters your faith, okay? And you say, well, I'm not afraid of everything. Well, let me help you understand something. A little bit of fear grows into a lot of fear if you don't snuff it out with faith before it's all over with. So fear not, but that's, that, that's not what I want to dwell on. I want to dwell on these next two things. Be glad and rejoice, all right? Now, everybody in this house, show me what glad looks like. That's glad, all right. Some of y'all hadn't made it yet, all right. And now maybe now you're doing better. Ah, ah, amen, all right. Now, everybody in the house, show me what rejoicing looks like. Some of y'all need to do that during worship. Hallelujah. That's the first time I've seen some of you do it. All right, okay. Notice this, notice this, notice this. He said, be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do. What is he said? Do you get that, Amanda? Did you get it? I'm going to help you get it. He said, you be glad and rejoice because of what I'm going to do. Do you know how we usually do it? We don't get glad and rejoice until God does it. God said, do it ahead of time. God said, be glad and rejoice because of what I'm going to do. Don't wait for God to do it. That's not faith. That's not faith. Oh, that, that's not faith. I'm, I'm, I'm ending this. We're going to be out of here for 12 o'clock. I'm going to shock all of y'all. Hallelujah. All of this. But get this now. He said, be glad and rejoice for the Lord will do. In other words, God said, Janice, God said, go to praising before it ever happens. Don't wait until it happens before you start praising. You say, well, what am I praising for? Okay, I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. You're praising by 
faith. You're countering fear. He said, fear not. He said, you start rejoicing and you get glad because of what I'm about to do in your life. You start praising me. Now notice this, notice this. He said, in all things give thanks uh, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. He didn't say for all things, but in the midst of all things, you go ahead and praise me. So when you start praising God, even though you're sick, when you start praising God, though you're in a battle, when you start praising God for freedom, though you're bound, what you're doing uh, is you're setting yourself up uh, for great things. Uh, You're preparing yourself uh, for God to keep his promise. Uh, I want to say to Messenger Church, uh, let's praise God no matter how we feel. Let's praise God when no matter what's going on, let's get glad, let's start rejoicing because God's about to blow through this place uh, and stuff's about to happen uh, that's going to make hell mad, uh, but God glad. Whoop, whoop. Hallelujah. Stand to your feet. Give the Lord a hand clap because it's coming. Give him a hand clap right now. You see, this is revival. This is, you see, you see, you see, it's ongoing. It never stops. And that's why the Holy Spirit has been teaching me now since I I first got into this and in the depth that I'm, I'm in. I'm not just talking about a preacher. I'm not talking about shouting and running and hollering. Oh, that's part of it. But revival is a consistent flow of the river of God through your life. And when that river starts flowing, good things start happening. Great things start taking place. Your children, all of a sudden, they start saying, yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Okay. All of a sudden, your marriage starts stabilizing. All of a sudden, your income starts. Why? Because God starts moving as you start rejoicing. Praise your way out of your darkness. Rejoice in the midst of your sorrow because God's about to do a great thing. Every head is bowed. Every eye is closed. I don't know your condition with God. All I know is there's basically three kind of people that are sitting in this service every time we have a service on Sunday morning. There are people that are saved. There are people that are lost. And there are people that are lukewarm. I could go to the backsliding element, but you're lost if you're backsliding, so you're part of the lost. You're either saved, you're lost, or you're lukewarm. Lukewarmness is the first step toward backsliding or toward sin. Only you know what your condition is with Jesus Christ. And if you think that living a life that pleases a pastor is all that it takes, if you think that living a life that makes you look religious is all that it takes, you're sadly mistaken. There's only one way to go to heaven, and that way is Jesus. Plain and simple, it's just Jesus. All right? So if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, and you'll say today, Pastor, I, I, my life is so full of turmoil and I've tried everything. I've, I've tried alcohol. I've tried drugs. I've tried sex. I've tried, I've tried money, eating. None of it makes me happy. None of it. That's because Jesus said you got to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, I don't care if it's one, two, or ten. It's irrelevant. Jesus died for one. For one but then can save the multitudes. So if you don't know him, if you're backslidden, maybe you're lukewarm, you say, Pastor, I want to get saved today. I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. Please pray for me, Pastor. If that's you, would you just very quickly, you don't have to do it and keep your hand up there, but very quickly, just slip your hand up and say, pray for me, Pastor. I'm not where I need to be with God. God bless these hands. You may put them down. You may put them down. Is there someone else, right? You've you've not already put your hand up. You want to put your hand up and say, Pastor, I'm not where I need to be with God. And I don't want to leave here knowing my soul is in danger of losing in the rapture. You better check your heart out, child of God. Are you lukewarm? Did you used to walk close to God, but today you're kind of doing your own thing and living your own life the way you want to live it, and God is not a relevant part of your being? Is there something wrong? 
God wants to pull you into himself. He wants to love on you, but you've got to surrender your heart. Is there anyone else that would put your hand up and say, Pastor, I know there's needs in my life. I've got to make some things right. Pray for me. Is there someone else that will slip your hand up right now? God bless this hand. Someone else. Amen. I'm not asking you to join Messenger Church. I'd be glad if you would after your salvation, but that's not what I'm about. I'm not out just to build this church. I want to build the kingdom of God. You become a part of Messenger Church to help us build the kingdom, but I'm about your soul right now. God wants to do a new thing in your life. You see, God is doing it again today. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right. Jesus, you've seen every hand that's been lifted up. You know the condition of every heart. Some have said yes, some have said no. Lord, I can't make them say yes, but Lord, I can pray for those that said no to your call. But Lord, those that said yes, would you give them the strength to step out and just kneel in this altar for just a few minutes and and make that open confession of their hunger and their desire for you? Would you help them, God, to step beyond their self and step into being that converted child of God that loves Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke everything that hinders them. I rebuke everything that binds them. And I speak truth upon them right now. All right. Every head is still bowed. Saints are still pleading the blood. If you put your hand up and you really mean it, I just prayed for you. God is going to honor my faith. I've just exercised faith for God to strengthen you to make an open confession of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want you, no matter what your condition is, no matter where you are, you put your hand up. That means you need to pray. I want you to step to the nearest aisle and just come and kneel in these altars and just surrender all of yourself to Jesus. Don't worry about what anybody